Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, also known, also known as HBOT, involves breathing pure oxygen in a pressurized room or in a tube. And it's well-established treatment for decompression sickness, which is a hazard of scuba diving. Have you done you done scuba diving? Did no. it go too deep? No. Okay. No, but I'm familiar with this. All right. But that's not all it's good for. It can be used to treat serious infections, bubbles of air in your blood vessels. And I think that's what happens when you go a little deep in the when you're scuba diving. It can also be used to treat wounds that won't heal, even carbon monoxide poisoning. In a hyperbaric oxygen therapy chamber, the air pressure is increased to three times higher than normal air pressure. Under these conditions, your lungs can gather more oxygen than would be possible breathing pure oxygen at normal air pressure. Your blood carries the oxygen throughout your body to help fight bacteria and promote healing. Here to discuss HBOT, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, is the medical director of Mayo Clinic's hyperbaric and altitude medicine program, Dr. Paul Kloss. Welcome to the program, Dr. Kloss. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Kloss. So uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, hyperbaric oxygen, has been around for a long time, hasn't it? I mean, uh, isn't that what we used to call the iron lung years ago, or is that a No, not different? the iron lung. The iron lung assisted, it was like a mechanical ventilator uh, without intubation. Uh, and only the bot, uh, lower part of the um, thorax was in, in that yeah. environment. Hyperbaric oxygen has been around, um, compressed air has been around for centuries. Uh, compressed oxygen uh, from a uh, use with diving and, and um, medical uses about 50 years. It evolved out of deep sea diving for uh, treating decompression illness and then evolved into um, medical realm about in the 1940s, 1950s. But Mayo hasn't been a player in the field for, for that long, have they? It's, how long ago was it that we got the hyperbaric facility? Uh, almost uh, 10 years to the date, um, not quite the date. We, we came up in um, 2008, uh, um, St. Patrick's Day in March. <laughs> how did you get interested in this field? Um, did it choose you? Well, no, it, um, it's, if you want the whole story, um, basically I was an airport rat, hung around airports. Uh, uh, I had a um, real love for aviation. So in um, uh, uh, high school and college, I uh, was involved in sports like uh, skydiving, hang gliding, uh, uh, eventually. And lived uh, to talk about it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I know something else he's going to do when he retires. <laughs> um, and then um, uh, uh, scuba diving and, and those kind of hobbies uh, type stuff. And so then when I joined the Mayo staff in order to um, uh, kind of uh, facilitate uh, being around uh, patients that had similar interests, I started doing um, uh, uh, commercial uh, aviation exams, uh, pilot exams mm -hmm. as an FAA examiner. And it was through that then uh, that the preventive medicine uh, division had wanted to put in a um, physiology lab, uh, hyperbarics and hypobarics altitude, pick up with um, Mayo's tradition of aviation uh, science. More oxygen and less oxygen, hypobaric? Correct. Uh, prior to World War II, the institution uh, played a real critical role in oxygen uh, supplementation for high altitude flying as well as the um, pressure suit for um, uh, fighter pilots and the likes. And anyway, that all took place in the 50s or uh, 40s and 50s and then um, uh, laid quiescent for all these years. And uh, we eventually breathed life back into it through um, clinical hyperbarics. And so you were, uh, were you part of the driving force behind getting in a hyperbaric facility at Mayo? I wouldn't say a driving force. We had leadership that uh, were retired Air Force, Dr. Hickman. Uh, he was instrumental in, in promoting it. It was an effort that had been pursued for quite a few years. In fact, another cardiologist, Dr. Alfred Beauvais, uh, he was on staff in cardiology in 1970s. Uh, he pursued it, but uh, there just wasn't an institutional appetite for it. Um, the only claim to fame I might have is that I kind of shamed the institution into it. Um, they, um, <clears throat> as we went to the various committees, they asked us, well, well, if it's so good, why doesn't Mayo not already have it? Oh, mm -hmm. wow. That was a recurring, uh, it, was, it was a recurring response. So we took the um, 2004 um, honor roll list from US News World Report and showed them that of the 14 institutions of which Mayo was second, um, at all the of time, the, now first. 
<laughs> well, I'll get to that part of the story. <laughs> um, of the 14 institutions, Mayo was the only one of the 14 honor rollies that didn't have hyperbarics available. Exactly. Right. Yep. So how does, I understand the bubbles in the bloodstream, the bubbles of air, but how does it make a wound heal? How does hyperbaric therapy work for that? Um, there's theories and then uh, there's evolving theories. Uh, uh, oxygen, um, uh, the tissues that are at risk aren't receiving enough oxygen. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. as Tom knows from his surgical service or practice, that... Um, He's just telling you that none of, not many of my wounds heal. <laughs> but it's partly because we treat a lot of patients who have peripheral vascular disease, atherosclerosis, diabetes, and, and they're tough. Right. They're, the blood supply is not very good, so the wounds are d difficult to get to heal. Yeah, so the, um, both the large vessels and then in the diabetic patients, uh, and we also see in our radiation injury patients, the small micro -ves vessels are, are, um, are void uh, or um, very limited. So the question is, how does oxygen uh, delivery help the wounds heal? Well, those tissues are struggling. They're at risk of infection. White blood cells don't work with uh, good or with inadequate levels of oxygen. Um, the uh, tissues uh, aren't receiving the stimulus that they need from uh, the growth factors. And hyperbaric oxygen dissolves uh, large amounts of oxygen in the blood, fluid part of the blood, not the red blood cells, and can get into those areas that are marginally perfused. It won't revive dead tissue. It won't revive tissue that's truly ischemic without any flow. Uh, but if we can squeeze some fluid part of the blood into those tissues, uh, it has the hope of regenerating uh, or re rejuvenating some of the tissues that are just on the margin. Uh, tell us about the, the facility and uh, who is likely to come there. We know it's somebody who has a, a problem with blood flow. Um, in most instances, but if you go there as a patient, uh, how does the, how does it work? Well, um, again, going back to um, convincing the um, institutional leadership that not only do we need it, but we could do it in a clinical sense. One of the questions we kept having was, well, if people have these terribly unsightly um, surgical wounds and, and um, non-healing uh, uh, tissue from radiation injury, which are really disfiguring and, and um, you have to have a strong stomach even as a physician to to really um, see them day in and day out. The question is how are you going to take a, um, a patient, uh, let alone a room full of patients, and have them exposed to this oxygen? Uh, and so the misconception is that it's the oxygen uh, surrounding the patient that is the benefit and actually what it is is it's the oxygen that's uh, breathed in dissolved uh, in the circulation through the heart and lungs and then transported the tissues. So um, all the patients uh, remain, uh, their surgical wounds are dressed. Uh, they're like uh, patients in any waiting area, except we take precautions from a fire st standpoint. Uh, they get out of their street clothes, which are predominantly polyester-based um, mm -hmm. fuel for fire, and uh, they wear cotton blends, which are less uh, uh, fire-prone. Uh, so have you ever had a fire? No. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, well, and but it's because of the increased oxygen in the atmosphere that you're concerned about that. Correct. Um, uh, that uh, supports a tremendous uh, um, uh, increase in combustibility. Uh, oxygen isn't uh, explosive, but it uh, supports combustion. All right. Our guest is the medical director of Mayo Clinic's hyperbaric and altitude medicine program. We're talking about hyperbaric oxygen. We need to short take a short break. When we come back, we'll be talking more with Dr. Klaus. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We are with Dr. Paul Klaus, and he is medical director of Mayo Clinic's Hyperbaric and Altitude Medicine Program. So you told us, Dr. Klaus, that you were interested in flying and did you say skydiving? You, yeah, you, yeah. You used to skydive? Do yeah. You, you do still? No, I gave that up when I got married. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't that she made you give it up, uh, give it up I'm sure. No, I, I, I mean, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought you'd say. So uh, you've told us about the, the uh, program, the hyperbaric oxygen facility. Uh, if someone comes there, they have to come daily, right? And how many days, how many times is the usual treatment regimen? Uh, it depends on what we're treating. Uh, 
if it's carbon monoxide, it could be a single treatment. Uh, but typically, we treat uh, three times, so that's uh, over a 24-hour period. So that, that, that together with air bubbles uh, for decompression or medical air gas embolism, those are our shortest uh, treatment regimens. To get the benefit for healing uh, poor um, wounds and diabetes or radiation injury, it's anywhere from 20 to 40 treatments, which translates into um, anywhere from six to eight weeks of uh, Monday through Friday treatments. It takes that long for the body to be stimulated uh, and to develop that response. The, the beauty of it is that investment in, in those uh, series of treatments is that the tissues that are healed um, have a higher level of, of um, circulation to them that persists for years. Really? We uh, interrupted a story that you were telling in the first half of this, of this interview about the, the ranking. Uh, why don't you finish that story? Well, the, the um, uh, close on that is that uh, uh, several years after we became operational, then Mayo uh, le- leapt to um, first uh, in the um, U.S. World Report as far as the number one institution. And so we take a pride and some credit for that. All because of hyperbaric oxygen. Well, there's a lot of good, a lot of reasons. <laughs> but <laughs> how often do you see somebody with carbon monoxide poisoning? Um, Unfortunately, we don't have as many referrals as uh, there may be patients that are out there. And some of that has to do with the, um, the uh, benefits of it are, uh, are questioned in the literature in regards to um, how many patients would benefit should all of them uh, be treated. Uh, how serious does the carbon monoxide poisoning need to be before it's beneficial to receive the hyperbaric oxygen. So for carbon monoxide, there isn't uniform um, uh, agreement across uh, institutions, including ours, as to um, which patients should be treated. And how do these people usually get poisoned? Um, <clears throat> it's usually in the um, uh, transition times of the years uh, where um, people are using uh, unventilated um, uh, furnaces uh, uh, and in the, the likes. Home, so. We had a um, uh, real unfortunate. We treated one individual, a young college uh, student, um, who um, survived were uh, uh, he and a number of um, uh, uh, individuals, including his girlfriend, had gone to a um, fish house uh, for the weekend uh, and it had a poorly ventilated uh, uh, heater. Uh, the young woman died and he uh, was severely uh, um, uh, poisoned and we treated him and he did well. Hmm. I've heard stories about athletes who use hyperbaric chambers for recovery after, you know, they're professional athletes. Is that the same thing that we're talking about here? Well, it is, and, and um, uh, it's not uh, voodoo medicine either. Uh, there's uh, good science behind uh, hyperbaric oxygen reco- um, aiding recovery of injured muscles. In fact, uh, training is, is a um, systematic injury of muscles, I believe, isn't it, Tom? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the recovery. And uh, you, all you have to do is follow the money uh, around the country in the um, Middle East and, and um, England and uh, Scotland, Ireland, where horse ra- racing is huge. Um, the same manufacturer that builds our medical chambers uh, sells equal number of uh, chambers that are used in the racing industry to um, not only heal um, injuries to tendons and the likes that would otherwise put a racehorse down, but to um, uh, increase their performance uh, as far as training. So there's a huge industry in, in the veterinarian practice. And so, um, uh, and some of the things that we're doing um, uh, were first discovered there and now are translating into um, medicine. I have actually been in this hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Yep, I well, went there. Dur- no, they <laughs> went during, uh, you had an open house, I remember. And uh, I got to go in there and see it. And it actually looks like a little submarine capsule. It's, I, I was surprised that that's just what it looks like. How many people or how many patients can you fit in there? We have um, two uh, what we call treatment rooms, two uh, large medical locks. Technically, we, can, uh, we could squeeze 12 individuals into each side, so we could, we could treat theoretically 24 individuals at one dive. Uh, realistically, our patients have a number of uh, positioning needs, and so we use larger recliners and gurneys. So we treat anywhere from uh, uh, four to six patients in one room. So typically, we'll treat 10 to 12 patients at a time. You call it a dive? We try not to. When we started the program, <laughs> <clears throat> when we started the program, uh, although it's come out of deep sea uh, treatments and everywhere around the world, they're called dives. 
we tried to make it uh, mainstream medicine and, and call it treatment or therapy. But uh, pretty soon, even our patients are di- calling it dives. And You know, I, I, part of the issue with this for me, uh, actually, now I'm a believer. But you never know. If I, if I send you somebody who has difficulty healing a wound and you give them 20 treatments of hyperbaric oxygen, you never know for sure if it was the hyperbaric oxygen or the wound might have healed on its own. How, how, what's your, how do you measure the success of what you're doing? Well, you're touching on a real important thing for medicine in general and in our in our practice as well is that we need to um, uh, always strive for better and better evidence-based outcomes. And so uh, hyperbaric oxygen has that evidence for diabetic wounds. Uh, there's been uh, randomized controlled trials that show uh, statistically uh, better improvements, 40 to 60 uh, percent uh, better improvement in the treated groups. Uh, are you seeing more and more patients? Is your facility busier and busier as the years have gone on? Gradually, we, we grow by 5 or 10% uh, per year uh, with volume, but we're really subject to individual practitioners, surgeons like yourself, who see it as a benefit and refer us patients. And so uh, should we see you retire in the future, uh, a number of patients are going to go without. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you had mentioned as you came in, you are getting ready to retire. So over the course of... Uh, no, no, wait a minute. He can't go before I go. <laughs> 2008 um, until this, till, till now, what has changed in the hyperbaric chamber type of thing? Or what is it that you're most proud of or will look back as accomplishment? Um building a safe and effective program and, and um, uh, bringing on not only the paramedical staff uh, trained to do hyperbarics, but um, colleagues. Uh, I was able to, um, the institution supported me to go off and, and do a, um, essentially um, in two years, what would account to a one-year fellowship. I did that in 2004. But then we um, grandfathered several of our um, colleagues into um, board certification. So myself and uh, three or four uh, rest of us are, are board certified. So that'd be my, my greatest accomplishment. Well, you know what? Congratulations on your upcoming retirement. Thank and, you. And thanks so much. We've learned a lot about hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and uh, I certainly use it. I'm a believer. And it took glad a while, to but he's around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> glad to know that you're doing more and more every year. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Tom Tracy. Dr. Paul Klaus is Medical Director of Mayo Clinic's Hyperbaric and Altitude Medicine Program. Thanks again.